Hello, my dear friends in Christ. I have a word here for you I'd like to share, and it is something that's going to be a big controversy. I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, it's to do with cursing. And I've gotten myself a little bit in the hot water uh, with individuals previously, and but I still have to curse. I still have to curse. Not in the sense that you might think, though. So, uh, I want to give honor, as Scripture says, give honor where honor is due. So, um, I want to give honor to Pastor Art Palowski, and uh, we had a good conversation here just before his church service uh, on Saturday, and brought it up yet again. He brought it up numerous times. Didn't like the idea of me swearing. And um, I have to say, I was not in my right mind. <laughs> as, <laughs> as he said to me, he says, nice to see you in your right mind. So um, that was some kind of, uh, well, just put it, let's put it this way. I haven't gone down to California and get myself all nicely cleaned out. That was definitely uh, evident, evident, Evidently? Evidently, that's the word I'm looking for. That was definitely and evidently some kind of a demonic thing there. So that's okay, because Jesus doesn't hate his church and his children for uh, struggling, dealing with demonic things from time to time. That's just something that has to be dealt with. And thankfully, I thank God for Apostle Catherine Crick for stepping into the fray in, in so many different categories, uh, not the least of which is the fact that she was uh, called out uh, not called out, but she was prophesied by some random prophet out of Africa who actually flew to L.A. Um, seven years ago and called her out when she was just 25 and uh, said, you're, you're an apostle and you're going to be going to the nations. And uh, that was not a lying prophet because that's exactly what she's doing now. She's going to the nations. And the primary evidence of an apostle in the day back when apostles actually used to walk like apostles and talk like apostles and do apostolic things was to cast demons out. So if there's nobody else casting demons out like her, then clearly she is an apostle. Demons can get cast out and people are taking notice and that's why revival's breaking out. But back to Pastor Art for a second. So he was right. Thank you for correcting me in that case um, because we all need correction and so I needed correction there. And what I was looking at, what I was suggesting was that I wasn't cursing, um, and I still don't believe I was, in the sense that what I was doing, that what was wrong with what I was doing is it was using language that doesn't edify necessarily and build up the church, okay? Um, I don't believe it was cursing in the sense that a curse is a an empowerment to fail where the blessing is an empowerment to prosper or succeed. So I wasn't using the word specifically to just rah, 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 at people. It was, uh, it was a response to an injustice and calling something out. Just like Jesus would call out a brood of vipers. He'd call uh, whitewashed tombs. He'd call... Um, uh, you sons of the devil, and as I say, you know, what's worse, to, to call somebody a son of a B-I-T-C-H or call somebody a son of a devil? I think going down to the devil level is probably even worse. But, uh, you know, and Art himself actually uh, has no problem with using words to aptly describe people like Nazis and, and so forth. Um, so words are very powerful, words are creative, and when they apply, you use them. But where I, I agree... Um, was that the word itself just, it kind of rubs people the wrong way, and in my right thinking, it rubs me the wrong way. I don't like those words. I never did, but then for a season, it was like whatever demonic doctrine I was believing at that time to make me think it's okay to speak that way. Um, I don't think that anymore. So in my right mind, in my right frame of mind, it's just, if nothing else, it's just coarse. It's, it's not edifying. It's not building people up and it's a, it's a it's coarse verbiage so I don't use it so praise God um, but I still curse so what I mean by that is back to the proper definition of what I'm describing as a as a blessing and a curse blessing being an empowerment to prosper and a curse being uh, a limiting factor it's an empowerment to fail 
then there's a place where things need to be cursed. Let me take you to the scriptures. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're looking at Mark chapter 11 here today. And the power of life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit, according to the book of Proverbs. So let's see a great example of what I'm talking about here in Jesus in Mark chapter 11. And we're going to look right from verse 12. Okay, I'm, I'm reading from the Passion Translation. You can read from whatever translation you like. Um, I like tra the Passion Translation. I just believe it. Um, much like the NIV at the time or the NLT, it just kind of brings things to life. But in a lot of capacity, it actually brings things back sharper and more focused. Um, it's not a message translation. It's not like a transliteration. It is it is doing a better job taking the essence of some scriptures. And, and you, you can even uh, go into, uh, I, I read it online. I want to get a hard copy of it, but you can actually pull up a specific part of the text here. And it'll give you... Um, well, you know what? I'll, I'll read it, and if, it think, if I think it applies, I'll, I'll pull it out here. Mark 11 and verse 12. The next day, as he left Bethany, Jesus was feeling hungry. He noticed a leafy fig tree in the distance, so he walked over to see if there was any fruit on it. But there was none. Only leaves. Now get this, for it wasn't yet the season for bearing figs. So... You'd think Jesus should have known that it wasn't fig leaf or fig tree, fig fruit producing time for the fig tree at that particular point in time. So Jesus spoke to the fig tree, saying, No one will ever eat fruit from you again. Now, I'm just going to relocate here. I like the scenery, but I think it's going to be a little windy on the mic here, so I'm going to relocate here. One second. And the disciples overheard him. When they came into Jerusalem, Jesus went directly into the temple area and overturned the tables and benches of the merchants who were doing business, business there. One by one, he drove them all out of the temple courts, and they scattered away, including the money changers and those selling doves. And he would not allow them to use the temple courts as a thoroughfare for carrying their merchandise and their furniture. Now you got to remember, Jesus got a bit of a temper going on here, but he's the son of God, the perfect spotless lamb, perfect sinless son of God who bore your sin and my sin only because he was the only perfect human being to ever live to be able to do that because he was God, because he is God. So when we see him in a what would we would some would classify as a fit of rage evidently it wasn't a fit of rage evidently he was operating in his holiness to be flipping tables in his holiness so there's a noodle scratcher for you verse 17 then he began to teach the people saying does not the scripture say my house will be a house of prayer for all the world to share but you have made it a hangout for thieves. When the chief priests and religious scholars heard this, they began to hatch a plot as to how they would eliminate Jesus. But they feared him and his influence because the entire crowd was totally captivated by his teaching. So he and his disciples went the nights, sorry, so he and his disciples spent the nights outside the city. Now in the morning, they passed by the fig tree that Jesus spoke to. And it was completely withered from the roots up. Peter remembered and said to him, Look, teacher, look. That's the fig tree you cursed. It's now all shriveled up and dead. Okay, let's park it there for a second, and let's let's analyze exactly what are we what are we reading here? Like what, this is this is uh, cutting some new territory, cutting a new cloth. Here's uh, as I remember, uh, what was it Kenneth Copeland used to say? Uh, 
was it Kenneth now? I don't even remember who said that common phrase. Cut new territory. Blazing a new trail here. Theologically, anyways. Jesus is flipping tables and calling people out and cursing fig trees because he's hungry. It's lunchtime and there's no fig on it. And What's going on? What is his perfect holiness, his 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 grace, his perfect holiness? What is what is he doing here? That he's operating in his perfect righteousness, doing things that are like way outside of our paradigm here. Well, he's teaching a principle. He's going to teach a principle right next verse, but he's he's already demonstrating a principle. And the principle here is that of Proverbs, which is you, life and the death are in the power of your tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Your, your words carry power. When you speak, when you open up your mouth, there's no such thing as mindless, idle chit chat. Um, apostle Catherine Crick talks about how, before getting called as an apostle when she was 25, she said she was just like the chatty Cathy, like every other girl her age at that point, and she would just use her words to describe whatever emotions and feelings were at that time. Uh, as any young girl would be talking and just kind of flippantly just letting the word. But when she got a revelation of this, she's like, I, I went through this once before myself. It was like just a period of silence, like turn that thing off. Like this is such a holy instrument. James describes it as that the, the, this very tongue has the power to be set on fire by hell. So we got to be careful. So what's going on here? Is Jesus, he's hungry? Didn't he fast? Frustration? Demonstration. He's demonstrating anything, living or dead, inanimate or a living object. I mean, he's going to talk about this moving mountains here right right next year, in two verses from now in verse 23. Couldn't he have just spoke, if he was just simply wanting to demonstrate something, could he not have spoke to a boulder uh, that 20 men couldn't roll and just say, be thou removed, be cast into the sea, and all of a sudden, whoo, this thing was flying into Galilee, and it's like, Jesus, that was lit, man. Whoo, did you see that rock fly? I mean, he tells us that we can speak to mountains and they'll move, so sh that would have been classic for Jesus to demonstrate with an inanimate object. But he didn't. He chose to speak to an object of life, an object that he ordained to produce. And I think this is the key issue here, is everything is ordained to line up with the kingdom principles of our creator God. If he des designed it for life, if he's designed something to produce for life, for the betterment, betterment of his creation, and it stops short of its purpose in time, then if it serves no useful function in the kingdom anymore, it's gone. And humanity is even compared in this regard that we are, we've got so many years to produce good fruit. And Jesus is graceful. He's gracious. He's, he's actually, he's more merciful in this regard. Uh, this was maybe a, more of a misunderstanding that I've had of grace and mercy. mercy. God is gracious. You know, by grace are ye saved through faith. So in the midst of our devilish ways, he comes in and says, no, no, it's okay. You know what? I love that one. You know, while we were all yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. Shall we, uh, how does it go? Much more. There's a bunch more. Much more is in that chapter 5. Uh, anyways, it's by his life that, that we are fruitful, productive. It's before it's in him that we live and move and have our being. So, so if we're not producing, though, there is an expiration date for everybody. And at that point, that's when the eternal flames of hell kick in. And there was no point in that creation uh, as far as Christ is concerned. And uh, he... It never produced. It never produced. And I would even take it a step further to say it was never designed to produce. According to Romans chapter 9, it was a vessel of dishonor fitted for destruction. 
Because, yeah, he has the sovereign authority to design by intention what vessels are for f destruction and what vessels are uh, objects of his mercy and his grace. So, lest any of us should boast, any of us who find ourselves in his presence eternally, we owe him all the gratitude in the world forevermore. And everyone else got a measure of grace as well. Their measure of grace was to breathe oxygen, maybe to live 30, 40 years in complete and utter rebellion to the kingdom of God, doing what they wanted. That was their grace. Their grace was just to go and live life however they wanted. And God gave them that time. And they did what they were created to do, which is just to rebel. But as far as cursing a living animate thing that Jesus originally he was the author of life to that tree he spoke he would speak and that life would come to that tree so now here he is cursing it yes the master deserved to eat at that moment no there was no fig on it and yes Jesus would curse that fig and uh, that tree would die so here's what I'm getting at. Here's the greater principle, I believe, uh, of application, especially in the compressed time that we're living in right now. If we have power with our words in anything, whether it be inanimate or in this case here, even if it's animate, even if there's life involved, like this fig tree, sap running through it, yet he stops that and, and puts an end to it. Anything that runs cross grains cr uh, sideways to the purposes of the kingdom of God at a minimum much more if they are now limiting hindering silencing censoring getting in the way of diverting and stopping the purposes and the counsel of God and his kingdom in this earth and his dominion and his rulership right now as he's preparing to wrap this whole thing up, as the shakings are going on, and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here now. The kingdom of God has all, is all, I mean, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you to the disciples 2,000 years ago. How much more manifest is the kingdom of God here now? That's why we're seeing the shakings, folks. When you have two tectonic plates pushing so hard against each other and shifting everything, it's going to create a massive chaos on the surface for anybody living there. Might be a volcano, might be a, simply an earthquake, but you're going to suffer some consequences when you've got two kingdoms that are crashing and rubbing against each other. Satan's was nicely entrenched here, but it's been pushed, it's get, been getting pushed out for the last 2,000 years. He had rulership for 4,000 years, and then Christ came and said, okay, we're changing course now. And it's taken 2,000 years for the kingdom to build up and get to this point where it is creating such, it's, it's such, sending such a reverbering frequency shock against the kingdom of darkness that everything is in upheaval because the tectonic plates are shifting. And so for those of us on the surface, we're all caught up in this. But the good news is it's Satan's kingdom that's getting uprooted. That's part of the shift. Glory be to God. And it's only going to be Christ and his kingdom left to rule. Hallelujah. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus yet, and you haven't made him Lord of your life, today is a really, really sweet, precious, beautiful day to do so. Here in Calgary, it's going to be 26 today at the high. And blue skies, couple scattered clouds. It's a gorgeous day to receive Jesus. Because things from here, we've seen upheaval over the covid three years of nightmarish hell that we went through but that's nothing nothing compared to what's coming with the climate change religion in the 15 minute cities and mass ca communism spilling over and you're going to have to make some choices you're going to have to make some greater sacrifices than just giving up your job some are going to be asked to give up their lives so I don't know where you draw your strength from if you haven't received Christ as your savior at that point all I can say is, in the words of Liam Neeson in the uh, movie uh, Taken, good luck. I'm going to do it with Christ. I'm going to do it with the empowerment of Jesus. And I'm going to do it victoriously and successfully. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm just going to lead my friend in faith in prayer. In case they haven't done it. Jesus, you're my God. You're my Savior. I tap out.
I tap out to Jesus. Come be my Lord. I, I do a 180. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to agree that the way I'm living is rebellious. And I'm going to follow you in Jesus' name. It's just that simple. You got born again. So Jesus is speaking in curse and trees. Then that also means that not only can we, as he's going to teach in the next couple of verses here, we must, anything that's out of line and out of sorts with the kingdom of God, it, we must curse that thing at the root, even if it be something living. Let me explain. So let's let's move on in our study here first. Mark 11, 20. Let's set this over here. Hallelujah. A little bit sunny here today, so all right. Praise God. My U version Bible on my iPad, it's the iPad is an older iPad, so I can't bring the software up current, and so it's uh because of that it just takes a little bit of time to load, so if I haven't been reading in a few minutes, it'll just power down. I should be able to adjust that. I'll, I'll take a look at that after the video here. U version, U version. Verse 22, Jesus replied, Let the faith of God be in you. Listen to the truth I speak to you. Whoever says to this mountain with great faith and does not doubt, mountain be lifted up and thrown into the midst of the sea, and believes that what he says will happen, it will be done. I believe this was a further demonstration. I believe Jesus said this because I believe that Jesus was, in fact, speaking to his mountain. Now, you might ask, what, what mountain would Jesus contend with? What was, a, what was a challenge? What was a problem for Jesus that he had to speak to mountains? The mountain of faithlessness that he was coming against, the unbelief and the doubt that he was coming against, and so I believe, in my heart of hearts, I believe that Jesus was looking at his people and he was pointing their hearts out and he was saying, I am speaking, I'm, I'm demonstrating to you what I'm going to say, but I'm speaking to your heart right now. I'm speaking to your heart. I'm saying, doubtlessness and unbelief in your heart, be thou removed, be cast out, be thrown into the sea so that all doubtlessness and faith forevermore amongst his true believing church would operate in great measures of faith now with that mountain of doubt and f unbelief removed. That's my personal view. In fact, to confirm that, he goes on and, and almost seems to reiterate what he just said in 23 by saying it again in 24, but without the doubt factor. He says, This is the reason I urge you to boldly believe for whatever you ask for in prayer. Be convinced that you have received it and it will be yours. So notice he's not talking about doubt and, and unbelief anymore. He's just talking about, go ahead. Whatever you believe now, whatever it is you desire in the King James, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, 
You go ahead and believe for that now, and you shall receive it. Easy peasy. Why? Because the doubt's taken care of. Thank you, Jesus, for to casting out the doubt for us. For us believers, you spoke to your to your mountain in verse 23, which was all that doubt that you were coming up against. You spoke to our hearts, and you moved that doubt. You said, doubt, get out. So thank you, Lord, that we are doubtless, we're a doubtless people. We're not a double-minded people. We're not an unstable people like James talks about. No, we are singular in our view and faith and expectation of you because you've removed the doubt now in 23. So now we believe that in 24, everything that we desire when we pray, we believe that we are going to receive it and we are going to have it. Hallelujah. So Jesus, it's all about teaching about we can have what we say. Powerful. And Jesus demonstrated it with the fig trees. Like, you're not producing. Bye bye And all humanity is going to face that one day if we weren't producing. But it's not for the believer. It's not for uh, effort. It's not a workspace religion that I'm talking about. Obviously. It's about just getting the junk out like I did in going down to Los Angeles there to uh, to sit under the precious anointed teaching and ministry of Apostle Catherine Crick, which takes a level of humidity, humility, I might add, to have been in the faith for some 30 years. And here God calls this little girl into ministry and she's casting devils out like I've never seen with such a sweetness and a gentleness. <laughs> she's like, you must go. Stop your fuss. Stop your fooling around. It's like talking to six-year-olds, and all these demons are listening to her. It's kind of kind of rubs you the wrong way if you're in your own arrogance and thinking, "Well, I've been in ministry for thirty years. I've no, I've been been baptized Holy Ghost. I'm a believer. I'm Christ." It's, it rubs you the wrong way, but that's the ways of God. Is that He appoints and chooses and selects and and places into office who he's going to place into office whether that's going to offend you and rub you the wrong way or not and sometimes he's going to do it because it's going to rub you the wrong way just because he's got some stuff to work out of your heart hallelujah but I, one of the things i really most admire is her willingness to use the name apostle that she was called out as and she offended a lot of people and i gotta ask again so and, and i honor her for that as an apostle who hasn't used that title uh, and hasn't r really expected anybody to use that title with me even though I myself have been recognized by another apostle and prophet okay uh, but I don't go around demanding that people refer to me as such I don't know maybe I should maybe I should maybe I tell me what your thoughts are maybe I should put Apostle Robert on my Facebook page um, here's the thing that irks me as well is that I, I remember hearing different pastors talking about, uh, and, and this is when maybe I got the false humility thought that don't go by the name apostle because you don't want to distance yourself from other people. And, uh, and, and the, the line of argumentation that I heard from this former pastor was that, you know, these apostles and these prophets, and they're just putting it on their business card and, and, uh, saying hey i'm apostle such and such or i'm a prophet such and they're just putting it on these business cards and on their websites and how dare they how dare they well so help me out with this then so is um elon musk supposed to say your humble servant on his business card call such and such a number here's my email address your humble servant no, it says CEO, because he's the CEO. So why should an apostle or a prophet take this false humility to make the pastors happy and take that off the business card? The pastors put it on their business card proudly, but no, only the office of a pastor can put that on his card, or maybe an evangelist. But certainly never, never a prophet or an apostle. I think, I'm, I, I, think I need to put apostle on my website now or on my Facebook page, just because of that alone, just because it's going to rub people the wrong way, because it needs to, because the church has got to grow up. Hallelujah. So yeah, I think I'm going to do that right after this video. I'm going to go put Apostle Robert on my Facebook page. <laughs> ah, so good. Praise God. Anyhow, 
speak to your mountain, and it's going to move because Jesus took care of the doubt. And if you got something to curse, you curse. But the right kind of curse, not just the coarse jesting, uh, coarse language, it's an uh, uh, offense. The, the powerful curse, that it's the disempowerment to make something fail that needs to fail. Something that's running contrary to the kingdom of God that's hindering the kingdom of God, that's censoring the kingdom of God. I've been cursing Facebook for, for several years now, and some bigger mountains just take a little longer to move. So, but you don't move your faith. You just move that mountain. You keep speaking till that mountain falls. I speak to you, Facebook, right now. You are cursed at the root. You are in a violation and an abomination in the kingdom of God. You set yourself up that you are there to give a platform, and then you silence the Christians and those of political persuasion other than your own, and you cut them off, and you interrupt their signal, and you shadow ban them. And I curse you at the root, Facebook. May you dry up, wither, and die, and may another take your place. May you lose all your customers. May your organization shrink so small that it's everybody's looking at it going, that was Facebook. Like a blockbuster video, may you just be a distant memory. May you be something like, like Sears Canada. Like Sears Canada. When I cursed Sears Canada and the way they, they treated me, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in, in that environment when I worked there. And it took three years for that thing to shrivel up at, at its root, but three years later and 30,000 unemployed people because that Sears Canada shriveled up at its root and was no more. There's power in our words, folks. I curse you at the root, fa Facebook. May you shrivel up and die and may a kingdom-mandated, kingdom-assigned, kingdom aligned social media come up and take your place and be bigger than you ever were in Jesus name that's my teaching for today God bless you